Tunisia is often described as the only Arab revolution success story. Three years after the uprising which brought down the dictator Zain al-Abdin Ben Ali, the country is transitioning into a multi-party democracy. Three years after the revolution that uh, kicked off the Arab Spring, there's a feeling of despondency and frustration here in Tunisia, a feeling that the fruits of the revolution really haven't begun to take shape. There are soaring prices, there are stagnant salaries. On top of that, there are about a million Libyans who fled the chaos in their country and put a strain on services here in Tunisia. Finally, there's a prospect of the secular bloc controlling the parliament and the presidency. And if that happens, some people say a return to Ben Ali type authoritarianism is imminent. Tunisia's president has limited powers in a political system dominated by parliament. Nevertheless, he's the commander of the armed forces. He sets foreign policy with the prime minister. He represents the state and he ratifies treaties. Although 27 candidates, ranging from nationalists and leftists to independents, ran for president, only two had a realistic chance of winning. The incumbent president, Monsef Marzouki, is a secular human rights activist who governed for the last three years in coalition with the Islamic and Nathda party. The 69-year-old campaigned on the promise of greater justice and a decisive break with past authoritarian governments. Meanwhile, Beji Qaid Asebsi is the leader of the secular Nida Tunis coalition. Asebsi, whose party won the most seats in parliamentary elections in October, is 88 and held public office under both Ben Ali and independence leader Habib Bourguiba. He's based his appeal to voters on stability and experience, as well as a secular outlook. When people talk about Tunisia, they often remark on the divide between the more Islamic parts of the country and the more secular parts. We're here in Hammamet, which is a, a big beach resort. Lots of European tourists come here. Perhaps this place symbolizes the more secular, liberal part of the country. And therefore, it's not so surprising that Nadar Tunis has chosen this as a venue to hold one of its biggest pre-election rallies. On the eve of the first round of the presidential election, this almost felt like a victory rally for the main secular bloc in Tunisia, Nidar Tunis. The party, which is rumoured to be supported by Saudi Arabia and the UAE, is a sometimes awkward coalition between members of the old regime recast as nationalists, leftists and others. They seem to have temporarily at least come together with one aim, to defeat the Islamic parties. The mood at this rally was undeniably triumphant. But doubts still remain over how the secular bloc will deal with the country's Islamic politicians and activists, as well as the media, should they come to dominate all the main levers of the state. There are parts of the Tunisian capital which look more like Europe than the Arab world or Africa. French is widely spoken, European dress is the norm, and cafe culture reigns supreme. These are the strongholds of Tunisia's westernized liberal secular elite, the stronghold of Nidar Tunis voters. Tunisia may have its ardent secularists, but we should still basically remember that this is a deeply conservative Islamic country. And the Islamic parties may have lost ground in recent elections, but they still have huge popular support and are deeply embedded in the population. The main Islamic party in this country is an Nahda, which is often described as moderate, and it's a party which has reconciled itself with a democratic secular state, and it's often criticized by fellow Islamist parties for making too many compromises. The an Nahda party is the most powerful Islamic force in Tunisia. Emerging in the 1980s under Rashid Ghanoushi, its leaders were forced into exile and the party's activities were forced underground by the Ben Ali regime. But in the first elections following Ben Ali's ouster in 2011, An Nahda won 37% of the national vote and 40% of the parliamentary seats. Often described by the Western media as moderate Islamist, 
and Nahda believes in a greater role for Islam in public life, but also remains committed to personal freedoms, economic liberalism and good relations with the West. It also has very close ties to the state of Qatar and Al Jazeera TV station. For three years, An Nahda governed the country in coalition with two small secular parties. But in parliamentary elections in October 2014, it saw its percentage of the vote decrease to 27% and became only the second biggest party in parliament behind Nida Tunis. When we were in power, we tried to avoid dividing the country into Islamists and non-Islamist camps. We are a civil democratic party and we behaved responsibly and saved Tunisia from going down the route of civil war. Also, we never promised to solve all the social and economic problems here which have existed for 50 years in a three-year period. Instead, we promised to safeguard the revolutionary process and maintain peace and a national consensus from the middle ground. And that's what we did. The Anatha party didn't field or endorse a candidate in the presidential elections. They say they took this decision as part of their consensus-based strategy to put national unity above party interest. Nidar Tunis and Anahda have a large majority in parliament. This is the message of the voters and Nidar Tunis must recognize that. Tunisians want cooperation between the two major parties. And that's why we are proposing a government of national unity. We have big challenges ahead of us and no one party can govern on their own. Nidar Tunis needs to behave responsibly, otherwise the next five years will be lost. Anada's time in power was more negative than positive. They weren't ready for power and they wanted to dominate the government by creating a false coalition with some small secular parties which had little popular support. And Nada had no programme. They just had slogans which they used when they were in opposition. And that's why they lost a third of their voters in recent parliamentary elections. Although Tunisia is an overwhelmingly moderate Islamic country, the influence of a more conservative Salafi brand of Islam is also felt here. <laughs> Most Tunisian Salafis have accepted the authority of the state, but some, widely known as Takfiris, have taken up arms against it. The Takfiris believe that those who don't follow their thinking are kuffar or infidels, and they've attempted to impose their will by force. An Nada tried to dialogue with the Takfiris at the start. They also let them take over several mosques for and allowed this Takfiri phenomenon, which is funded by Persian Gulf countries, of course, to grow. But then An Nada moved into open conflict with them after the Takfiris attacked the US embassy in Tunis in 2013 and when opposition politicians were assassinated by them. The Takfiris are a danger to the whole world and this phenomenon is now everywhere, in Iraq, Syria, Mali and Nigeria for example. Terrorists and extremists just use religion as a vehicle to attack the state. We waged a war against them when we were in power. The next government must prioritize this fight against terrorism. Tunisia is flanked by Algeria and Libya, two countries with active extremist groups that have pledged allegiance to ISIL. It's estimated that around 3,000 Tunisians have embarked on so-called jihads in Libya, Iraq and Syria, something people across the spectrum of Tunisian society consider a major problem. But whatever the attitude may have been in the past, there now seems to be a zero-tolerance attitude by the powers that be in Tunisia towards the Takfiri trend and a determination to deal with them militarily. It's vital that we fight terrorism just like other countries are doing. But we have to admit that the war on terror has failed up to now. Even when we defeat the terrorists, we just seem to displace the terrorism to somewhere else. There's no real project to fight terrorism, and we need one. Tunisia has a rich tradition of religious reform, but Takfiris say the state itself is illegitimate. Some of them have taken up arms, and not just in Tunisia, but elsewhere in the Arab and Islamic world. But I believe this is a temporary phenomenon, because they depend on a certain social and political climate.
So we've come to Bizet, which is about an hour north of Tunis, just to get a flavor of what people outside the capital think about politics. Now, Bizet is a town which is known for its liberal culture, but like all the other major towns in Tunisia, it also has its Islamist, conservative-leaning areas. In fact, the Tunisian state came in militarily into Bizet last year just to repress what they called a challenge to the authority by Takfiri extremists. We've also come to Bizet to concentrate specifically on young people because it's them that seem to have boycotted this presidential election en masse. Although over 60% of Tunisians voted in the presidential elections, virtually all observers noted the absence of young people. Youths were at the forefront of demonstrations which overthrew Ben Ali three years ago. So the question is, why have they seemingly abandoned the political process now? We pounded the streets of Bizet to find out. I didn't vote because none of the politicians represent me. I'm not against any of the candidates, but I refuse to vote for them too. I didn't vote because I'm not interested in politics. Tunisians aren't made for politics. I don't trust the candidates because they all steal. They didn't give me anything, so I won't give them my voice now. I just don't understand how people who claim to be intelligent can give those they ousted from power during the revolution the opportunity to return to power. This is a circus. It's abnormal. Young people made the revolution, but old men aged between 80 and 88 are ruling us. I didn't register to vote, and I don't trust any of the candidates. Had I registered, I would have probably voted for Mr. Esebsi. He's the least worst, I suppose. So for Tunisia's next generation, revolution fatigue seems to have set in. Rapid change hasn't happened, and the young are noted for their lack of patience. They had high expectations following the revolution, which was sparked by their frustration with unemployment, economic marginalization, and lack of social and political freedoms. But now they feel that their revolution has been stolen by political parties. The essential question in Tunisia is one of national unity and how to achieve it. The secular parties and their offshoots and supporters in Tunisia have one vision of what this country should look like. And the Islamic parties and their supporters and constituents have another vision entirely. Now, Tunisia hasn't thankfully descended into the violence of Syria and Libya. But if that essential question, the reconciliation between Islamic and secular politics isn't resolved, then it is conceivable that this country might go the way of its neighbours.